Good morning, Saints of First Church. Good morning. It is a joy to see you in God's house on this beautiful Sunday morning. We're glad all of you are here, especially those who are visiting with us. We ask all of you, whether you're a first-time visitor, a long-time member, or somewhere in between, if you'll sign the registration pad that you find at the end of your row, that we might have a record of your attendance with us on this Lord's Day. We appreciate that. We're thrilled you're with us in worship this morning. I want to share with you just a few announcements. You'll find these on the opportunities page in your bulletin. I encourage you to read that after service at your leisure. Let me share a few things with you, though. First of all, you notice you've got a couple of inserts. The first is uh, one of those special offerings that we take up as the United Methodist Church. Uh, this particular Sunday, we're taking up the offering for the Native American uh, Ministry Sunday. Uh, this goes for work uh, among our Native brothers and sisters. Uh, some of you may not know, but the largest Native American parish in America, I think, is in our conference. Is it at, uh, at, uh, in Pembroke area, it's uh, Prospect United Methodist Church. So that's the large, at least it used to be. I don't know if there's anything that's grown bigger than that. That's the, that was the largest Native American parish. So we encourage you to give to that as you feel led of God's spirit. You also have an insert in your bulletins uh, about the Mother's Day, Father's Day uh, honoring. Uh, you may honor or remember uh, mothers and fathers by uh, listing their names there and including a dollar per name. Get that to the church office. It's very, very important for you to get this in by the 23rd of April and note that this is the only sheet that is going in to the bulletin for this so if you're going to do dads as well you need to go ahead and do dads now and they will appear in in june at the appropriate time uh just a few more quick announcements wednesday night supper on the 18th we hope you'll come and be with us on on that time I uh, remind you about the combined service that is taking place in the sanctuary on the last Sunday of this month, the 29th. We'll be in the historic sanctuary at 10 o'clock. We'll have a worship together, and then afterwards we'll have a covered dish meal here at the church. We encourage you to come be a part of that wonderful time of worship as we uh, celebrate and remember the 100th anniversary of the old educational building. I uh, also want to remind you about the Missions Committee's annual yard sale that's coming up on May the 5th. If you have contributions to make toward the cause, I believe we have a trailer on site where you can put those, and you can come to the office and get that key and do that. And we encourage you to be uh, participating in that and put that on your calendar. Hope to see you on the 5th. Now, Ms. Cherry, you had an announcement you needed to make. Yes, um, all of you know Thank you, Ms. Cherry. Other announcements? If not, it is good to see you in God's house on this beautiful Sunday morning. Uh, before we begin our worship and song, I want to invite you to stand and turn to those people nearest to you and greet them today in the name of the Lord. Shalom, my brother. Dick, Dick, Dick. Was it today we're supposed to commission? Next Sunday. Okay, I couldn't remember. Okay, we'll make sure. Thank you. Hey, Janice, how are you? Good to see you. Good morning, sir. Good to see you, sir. Thank you. 
Go ahead. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living whatever foes may say. I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. Just the time I need him, he's always near. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Amen. Amen. I serve a risen Savior, He's in the world today. I know that He is living, whatever foes may say. I see His hand of mercy, I hear His voice of cheer. And just the time I need Him, He's always near. He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along my narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives in my heart. In all the world around me, I see his loving care. And though my heart grows weary, I never will despair. I know that he is leading through all the stormy blasts. The day of his appearing will come at last. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to me. Rejoice, O Christian, lift up your voice and sing. Eternal hallelujah, to Jesus Christ the King. The hope of all who seek Him, the help of all who find. The other is so loving, so good and kind. He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest fame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. 
found new meaning in a world filled with anger and sin. He touched me and I was receiving new life, peace and joy from within. I've been changed really changed, rearranged, not the same anymore. Things are different for me now, cause I've been touched by the fire, by the light, by the love of the man with the nail scarred hands. I've been changed. Lord God, we, we need a good touch from those nail-scarred hands this day. <laughs> Please touch us. Help us to be able to touch others with your love. We pray that you'll touch our country, touch this world, bring healing, bring hope, bring courage, bring righteousness, justice, and love. Help us to take a new look at those nail-scarred hands. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now is our time for a moment with the young disciples, and there's candy today, so I hope <laughs> plenty of you come up. <laughs> Still coming up. All right. How's everybody doing today? Now, I said there was candy today, but I never said I would share it with you. I'm fine to come without the candy. <laughs> well, as you can see here, I've got a bowl of candy, and now you guys are probably wondering, is he going to share or is he not? And yeah, I'll share with you. So go ahead and grab a couple of pieces. Grab one, grab two, grab eight. There should be plenty. <laughs> Whatever's left over, I get to eat, so. Well, way back in Acts 4, the disciples of Jesus and their community shared everything. They didn't just share their candy, but they shared their land, they shared their food, they shared money, they shared everything so that everybody in the community, thank you, everybody in their community didn't have any wants or any needs. Um, and as you eat your candy, I want you to remember that there are some people out there that don't 
have as much as we have. And we as Christians, we're called to help others that are in need. Let us look at the early church and see how they shared everything they had with others, how they took care of others. And let us go out into the world and do that with those that we see in our community who have needs today. Let us pray. Dear God, we love you so much. Help us remember that there are people in our communities who have needs, who may have less than us. Help us use what we have to help them in whatever way we can. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Unfortunately, our friend Bill McAdam, who was supposed to be leading us in this time of prayer and praise, has a knee that's hurting him real bad. So right off the bat, we have something that we can be praying about. The scripture that I'm going to be using at Centerpoint this morning starts off with the sentence that says, How great a love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called sons and daughters of God. And that is who we are. So in that identity, we come before you with this opportunity as the children, as the brothers and sisters in the faith, to lift up praises to God, but also to lift up concerns and things that are on our minds and on our hearts, waving, weighing heavily. Let's start on this side. Thankful to have my beautiful bride back in church with me this morning. Fantastic. Prayers for those all around the world who are less fortunate. Uh, I, this is a praise for my friend Ginger, who's sitting next to me. Today at 3 o'clock, she is being inducted in some... National Honor Society because of her awesome performance in her master's program at ECU. And I'm really right. proud because I can't remember anything. Okay. Moving on over. I would just like to praise God this morning first that he loves us, that he takes care of us if we trust him. And I have a prayer concern. Um, a woman, her name is Barbara Sutton. She's my honey's ex and the mother of his son. She's been, uh, they found cancer in the female parts. But they told her it's a cancer that could possibly come back. It's known for coming back. So we all care very deeply for her. So if you would, just keep her in your prayers that she heals good and that they just don't find it anymore for her. Thank you. Thank you. I think we should recognize one of our young people today. Annabelle Howdy took in several awards at the livestock show this recently. I would like to ask for praises and prayers for our military and our military families. And let you know all that this morning, uh, Dana Eddings gave us a presentation at the men's, uh, Methodist Men's Breakfast this morning uh, about a group called the Combat Warriors that he's a member of and uh, a, 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 an organization nationwide as well as locally. But just a very wonderful reflection on the work and, uh, that the military does and then the problems that many of these people have when they come out of the military. Thank you, Lee. 
Anything else from this section? All right. Good morning. I try not to update all the time because I know y'all have been praying for Tyler, um, but I have had several people ask me, and he is doing phenomenal. He's in Edenton. He has a new job at Nucor. Um, God is blessing him richly, and he is not forgetting that, that prayers and God has gotten him where he is. And thank y'all for continued prayers. Of course, it's not over. It never is with addiction. Um, but thank y'all for your love and your support, and he's doing great. Thank you. Um, please pray for the family of uh, Nancy and Dan Addis. Okay, thank you. At this time, let's enter into a moment of silent prayer and then join together in the prayer that the Lord taught us. Lord, hear the prayers of your sons and your daughters. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, Saints of First Church. It is a joy to see you this morning. It is good to be seen. Our text for this morning comes to us from the Acts of the Apostles. It's the fourth chapter, verses 32 to 35. We left the disciples sort of, uh, they initially were scared to death and cowering and not knowing what to do, and they saw Jesus, and that made a change in them, and this is sort of a continuation of what's going on for them. I invite you now, if you have your Bibles with you, turn with me here to the fourth chapter, verses 32 through 35, or you may look at the screen, but give ear now to the reading of God's Word. Now, the company of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet and distribution was made to each as any had need. Beloved, the word of God for the people of God in the house of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, for your word and for the gift of your church, we give you thanks and praise this day as we Meditate together now on your words. Bring to mind and to heart the calling you have laid upon us that we may be faithful in its fulfillment. In your name we pray. Amen. In his book, The Last Word, Bishop Will Willimon writes about the late Reverend Dr. Peter Gomes, the plumber professor of Christian morals and minister to the chapel on the campus at Harvard University in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Bishop Williman said of Dr. Gomes that he was determined to maintain a Christian presence on the campus of Harvard amid a sea of relativism that now exists in the university setting. Bishop Williman wrote of him that he embodied a dogged determination to proclaim the good news of Jesus to those who seem to know everything except Jesus. 
Not everybody on the campus had the same attitude as Dr. Gomes, as you can imagine. And Dr. Gomes, in this article that Bishop Wilman wrote, shared a story of a time when he was invited to visit one of the many deans there at Harvard in the dean's office. Dr. Gomes showed up. He was warmly received. They small talked for a few moments. And then the professor invited Dr. Gomes to come over and look out the window of his office that provided a beautiful view of the Harvard campus, including the memorial chapel that sat very squarely in the center of Harvard Yard, right in the center of the campus. They stood there and admired the view for a few moments, and then the professor said, you know, if we had it to do all over again, I don't know that we would have put the chapel right where it is in the center of campus. I don't know that we would have done that. Dr. Gomes was silent for a few moments, and then he turned to the dean and said, well, we're there, and we're not going anywhere. So you might as well get used to it. I read that story again this past week and I was reflecting on First Church and our mission and ministry and our place in this setting, in our community and in the world at large. I'm sure we have opinions favorable of this place and of our assembly here. There are others who don't share that positive image, I'm sure. No doubt there's probably a few people even in Washington who go by and look at this place here at the corner of Van Norden and West Second and say, you know, it's a real shame that they couldn't think of anything better to put in that beautiful prime location than a church. What do we say to those people? Before we answer that question, I want us to reflect for a few moments on our text. And in so doing, be reminded of what it means to be the church in this place at this time. This morning, my brothers and sisters, I invite you to remember who we are. As I said, you know, we looked last week at the text, and very early on, the, the witness of the disciples in the scriptures delivers, leaves you at least with an initial impression that they're not going to be capable of even sustaining themselves, much less becoming a movement that changes the world and, in the words of someone, uh, to become the hope of the world. And yet, as we remember in our text last week, the disciples met the risen Lord. And when that happened, they were given the courage and the power and the opportunity to become who they had been called to be, to be the church. And it's in their confident, glad, and generous example that you and I find everything that we need to guide us as we try to follow in their faithful footsteps and the footsteps of all the faithful who have come since that time as we seek to live into our calling to be who we are as the church. Now what is it that our text teaches us this day about being the church? Thank you for asking that question. I want you to understand, you and I embrace our true identity as the church when you and I are willing to embody God's gift of life. Everybody say life. Life. I want you to understand that whatever else the early church was, it was a place of life. It was a place where those followers of Jesus shared life together. They met together. They ate together. They studied together. They sang and worshiped and prayed and rejoiced together. For them, being the church was not a matter of going to a location. For them, being the church was a matter of identity. It was a matter of who they were. 
Wherever they met, whatever they did, whether it was on a Thursday afternoon or a Sunday morning, they did it as the body of Christ. They, they were the church. Living, loving, learning together. And it's as they did that that they exhibited these characteristics of generosity that we read about. And of fellowship. And of service. And of mission. And you read that and there's no wonder that the early church exploded in growth. Because it was a place of life. Right? How many of you have been to uh, Disney World? A few of us. My favorite place, and Carrie and Ingrid and I went in October 2000 to Disney World. My favorite place in Disney is Epcot. Anybody else love Epcot? I love me some Epcot. That's about the only way somebody like me is ever going to be able to go all the way around the world, you know? So we're going around the world on our world tour, and we go into France, which is about five steps outside of England. You know how that goes. And there was something very interesting there. There was a young lady there in a garden in France, and she was dressed in classical Roman garb. And she was dusted from the top of her head to the soles of her feet in this grayish-white chalk-looking thing. It made her look like a statue. And she was, in effect, a living statue. And she would stand there. It was amazing to watch her stand still. And every once in a while, she would change her pose a little bit. When people really weren't looking that much, I happened to see her do it. Well, not everybody had the advantage I had. And there was this one little boy that went up to the statue. And he reached out and he touched the statue's arm. And when he did it, the statue changed poses. And the little boy took off like he was shot out of a cannon. <laughs> and I think if we had the radar on him this morning, he'd still be running around somewhere in central Florida. I promise you. Now, that was hilarious to see, believe me, it was, a, it was a hoot. But I got to thinking about it, and I thought, you know, maybe there are a lot of people out there this morning who regard the church like that statue in France, the living statue. You know, they see the church, and that's a place where the statues go and sit for an hour, maybe two hours on Sunday, and that's it. And that's how they view the church. It is vitally important, brothers and sisters, that you and I embrace this idea of the church not as a location or not as an activity. We've got to embrace the idea of church as our identity, as our life, as who we are. Tim Unsworth in the National Catholic Reporter some years ago wrote an article, and they had done a survey among uh, Catholic churchgoers in the Chicago area and the New York area. They determined that in the Chicago area, the average Catholic churchgoer was going to church about 13 times a year. 13. In New York, it was about 10. However, in those same areas, people reported making up to 30 visits, 3 zero, 30 visits a year to Home Depot. Now, why in the world? Would somebody choose to go twice as many times to Home Depot or three times as many times to Home Depot as they would to the church? I thought about it. Could it be because the Home Depot is a place of action? A place where people are prepared to actually go and do something that makes a difference? Brothers and sisters, if we want to embrace our true identity as the church, then we've got to be about the task of embodying God's gift of life. We've got to be those folks that come together and share life together and be prepared together to go out and serve together to make a difference together. That's what it means to be alive. That's what it means to be the church. If we're going to embrace our identity as the church, we've also got to be a group of people who embody God's gift of love. Everybody say love. 
Oh, that's good. You got the love in. That's good. <laughs> we have to embrace that gift of love. Bill White tells a great little story about a Sunday school teacher who was teaching her class of five and six-year-olds about the Ten Commandments. And she explained to the kids what the commandment, honor your father and mother, meant. And she finished that and she said, are there any commandments that tell us how we ought to treat our brothers and sisters? Without missing a beat, one little boy raised his hand and said, thou shalt not kill. (laughs) Well, nobody said life in the family was easy. And that certainly includes the church. Now, I don't want you to fall out of your seat here, but listen to me. Believe it or not, there are times when conflict arises in the church. (gasps) There are times when brothers and sisters of Christ have hard words and harsh words toward one another. And it tempts them either to stand toe-to-toe and slug it out or to completely withdraw from the church and from the world. But I want you to understand that that's not God's will for us, nor is it the testimony of those first followers of Jesus. Bishop Joseph McKinney once said, It's easy to love the ideal church. The challenge is to love the real church. It's easy to love the ideal church. The challenge is to love the real church. Believe it or not, the early church was neither ideal nor perfect. In fact, it was a very real church. And there were conflicts and differences of opinion and hard words among God's early followers. But here's the difference. Those people determined that they were going to love the real church by loving one another. The community of the early church was a place that truly cared for one another. And their assembly, their gathering, their community was a community of love. And I don't think we need to underestimate that, brothers and sisters, because I don't care how big and bad you are in this world, deep down inside, and you may not want to admit it, but deep down inside, all of us want and desire and need to be a part of a community that's going to love us, and nurture us and help us to become the best person we can be. What better task could there be for the people of God than to do that? Some years ago, Reader's Digest had an article entitled, What Good is a Tree? Had some very interesting things to say. In the article it said that when the roots of trees come together and touch one another, they begin to form a network between one another, even trees of different species. And in some cases, that network can encompass a whole forest to the extent that if some of the trees have better access to light and some to water and some to nutrients, they all can benefit as a result of this interconnectedness. Isn't that a beautiful image of what the church should be all about? It's people who reach out to one another, connect with one another, love, support, nurture, bring along one another. If we want to embody our identity, our true identity as a church, then you and I have got to embrace and embody this idea of God's gift of love. We've got to do it, especially among one another. If we want to really embrace our identity as a church, we've also got to be willing to embody God's gift of light. Everybody say light. Light. The early church was indeed a community of life and of love, but they were able to do that because first and foremost, they were a community of light. They embraced the good news of God's true light of salvation and it allowed them to begin a task that has turned the world upside down. Did you hear in the text what it said? It said, with great power, the apostles bore testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. 
Because they were willing as God's people to embrace his light, to share his good news of salvation, it allowed them also to be people of life and love in the midst of a dying and loveless world. And that same calling and opportunity is available to us this day, in this place, if we are willing also to embrace God's light of salvation and grace. That ought to be, that conviction that Jesus Christ gives life, abundant and eternal, that conviction ought to be at the core of everything we say and do as individual believers and as the church. It's our task to seek out others who can be formed into what the Apostle Peter said in 1 Peter as living stones. They can be nurtured and grown into part of the community of faith. And if we're able to do that, if we're willing to do that, then regardless of how things may seem, the mission and ministry of this church will have an incalculable and eternal effect. Many, many years ago, a very small congregation in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, lovingly looked on as three young nine-year-old boys came forward, made their public profession of faith, and were baptized into the church. This little community had shared their lives with these young boys. They had shared God's love with them, and they had shared the good news of salvation with these little boys, and they responded. Sadly, some years after that, the church was forced to close, but the life and the ministry of that church continued on in the lives of those three boys in amazing fashion. One of them was a fellow named Dick White. Dick grew up to be a missionary, helped to convert hundreds of people to the Christian faith. One was a young man named Bert Newman. Bert Newman grew up to be a, a teacher, a professor in a school, helped to educate people about the good news of Jesus. The third was a fellow named Tony Campolo, who became a a very noted Christian thinker and professor at Eastern University in Pennsylvania. That little tiny church invested themselves in the lives of those young boys, loved them into the kingdom. And as a result, those young men grew up and continued the ongoing mission of the church that had loved them into the family as people of life and love and light. And I want you to understand, First Church has that same calling and that same opportunity as we embrace it by faith through grace. Can you imagine anything better than helping someone else come into the kingdom that has an invaluable and eternal effect on the, on the world? Wouldn't that be wonderful? Ed Rowell is the pastor of Tri Lakes Community Church in Monument, Colorado. He told an amusing little story about a fella in town that needed to find a dry cleaner. He had an item that needed to be dry cleaned. And he remembered in town seeing a sign in front of a building that said, one hour dry cleaning. And so he found the place and he went inside. He gave his garment to the clerk and said, I'll be back to pick it up in an hour. And the guy looked at him and said, "Uh, sorry, sir, I can't get this back to you before next Tuesday. The fellow said, wait a minute, your sign out front says one hour dry cleaning. The clerk said, oh, that. He said, oh, man, that ain't a description of what we do around here. That's just the name of the business. <laughs> this is First United Methodist Church. That's not our name. That is our calling and identity that we humbly and eagerly embrace this morning. We're not perfect, far from it. Sometimes we may butt heads a little bit. But with the help of God, we have determined that we are going to be a people of God's life, love, and light. That's who we're going to be. And to those people that look at that location at the corner of West 2nd and Van Norden and say, you know, that'd be a really good location for a green space or a park or an office building or a restaurant 
or a dollar store, we say this. With God's help, we're here. We ain't going anywhere, so you might as well get used to it. Because with the help of God, we are going to be who we are. Thanks be to God. Amen. This morning we find ourselves once more at the table of the Lord. As United Methodists, we believe this is indeed his table. We really don't have the right or the desire to turn anyone away from the table. And though none of us are worthy of our own merits to gather the crumbs from beneath the table. The privilege of coming forward as a child of the king was bought for us at great price. What's required of us is to have a humble and a repentant heart. A desire to be who the master has called us to be as people of life and love and light. So at the appropriate time, come as you feel led. The method we use here is intention. You'll be invited to come forward. We'll have a couple of stations here at the front. You'll be invited to take a piece of bread and dip it in the chalice and receive communion, after which you may kneel at the altar for a time of prayer, or you may return to your seat. On the night long ago when our Lord gave himself up for us, he took a piece of bread from the table, and he gave thanks to God for the bread. And he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took a cup from the table, and he gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to his disciples and said, Take this, I want you to drink it. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, Lord, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Lord, we ask that you pour out your blessing on those of us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. We'll invite the praise team and those who have been asked to help serve to come forward at this time. And the blood of Christ shed for you. Glory, the body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Janice, the body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Bill, the body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. The body of Christ made it broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. feast is prepared. Come, taste, and know that the Lord is good.
drink this wine in remembrance of me. Pray for the time when God's own will is done. In remembrance of me, heal the sick. In remembrance of me, feed the poor. In remembrance of me, open the door and let your neighbors in. Let them in. And become for dead. Drink and remember too that this is my body and precious blood shed for you, shed for you in remembrance of me. Search for truth in remembrance of me, always love in remembrance of me, don't look above, but in your heart, look for Do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. you I love you I am honored and grateful to be church with you let's go now as the church gathered into the community to lift up the mighty name of Jesus God bless you I love you have a wonderful week remember all that's going on until we're together again may the Lord bless you and keep you may the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace
We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. And we pray that all unity may one day be restored. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. We will walk with each other. We will walk hand in hand. We will walk with each other. We will walk hand in hand. And together we'll spread the news that God is in our land. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. All praise to the Father from whom all things come. And all praise to Christ Jesus, His only Son. And all praise to the Spirit who makes us one. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. 